Morning. Um, basically, how many DOCs we got in here? How many executive directors we have in here? Presidents? All right. So kind of what I'm going to do is kind of go through some uh, things that I am, am involved with at our club uh, on a daily basis and yearly and stuff. So we've kind of divided up. There's another session uh, I'm going to do at uh, 1 o'clock. It's basically going to be about uh, technical development, you know, your responsibilities, the DOC or club responsibilities towards the DOC. So this one will be kind of like A to Z, basically the basics of, uh, of being a DOC in a club. Um, so club structure, um, for many of you, this is, this is kind of what we have at our club, so you may not have as intricate. Uh, I know there's probably some small clubs and some large clubs in here. How many clubs have both uh, select and recreation involved? Better here. Uh, some, how many just rec? And just rec so, so then others just have travel. Then I assume. Would you call it travel, as well as read? Okay. So that's kind of what we have. We have we have travel and rec. Uh, we're about 6,500 kids um, in the club, and um, I always say it's that's nowadays it's probably about um, 18,000 parents based on the current trends of what's going on. So that makes it for a very interesting day or week. So we have in ours, we have an executive director, uh, we've got uh, myself as technical director, then we have a recreation director, and we also, that person basically, we, we kind of call that the Zone 1 program and, and the U.S. soccer curriculum. And that person for us, Aki Lake, actually works with our assistant coach with our U14 academy. So it's always good to have somebody who, not, if he's going to work with the rec coaches and rec players, but he's also got to tie in a little bit to what's going on at the other side of the club. So, it's good for us to have Aki working on both sides. We have business administration, uh, or administration, we have a couple of people actually in the office that do that. Um, our club president, we have a club president and a board of directors. Um, and that's um, interesting. Anybody on a board uh, other than president? Any other board members in here? And so it's, you get kind of like, um, I don't know, my process, you get a very crafty executive director and a good president. They kind of handpick the board sometimes. Is that kind of the norm? Is that kind of how it works? Yeah. So it, they're they're pretty good at that, but it's good. I mean, we have people on our board who are very good for the club, but they have nothing to do really with soccer. Um, I'll give you an example. This guy by the name of Chuck Bodie. He runs a you know CB flooring, but he's great on the board because he's in charge of um, you know basically sponsorship, sales, and development and stuff like that. And, and it's great. I mean, he's very active. Raises about. Hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year for the club, just you know, basically with sponsorship. So, it's nice. Um, so it's good to have a mix in your board of, of soccer people and non-soccer people. Uh, we also have people in the basically that do rec leagues. They do our, they're our scheduler, the registrar, facilities and, and and facilities managers. So, how many of you have your own complexes here? How many fields, just in general? Four, Four fields, turf. Grass, lit, lights. It's well. We'll get to that a little bit. It's tough dealing, trying to do all the different programs, you know, with with your facility. Um, we have nine fields, four lit turf, um, and a clubhouse. But it's still, as you grow, it's as you find out, it's not enough. You're always looking for ways, and so we utilize the county fields and and also Howard Community College in our area to make it work. Um, current trends in youth soccer. Basically, uh, more involvement from DOC and TD and, and basically the day-to-day -day of how the club runs. And so as a DOC, you gotta get more involved in that stuff. You can't, you can't, you can't think of it as a dirty word kind of a thing. Um, this is not easy running from back here, is it? Um, executive director as a club coach. Um, anybody in that situation? I am, and I kinda like it. But so I'm just curious because I think it's good to have somebody that's above you who on, on a, you know, on a daily basis kind of understand he's training his team. Ours currently coaches a U-17 second team, and he, he's good. I mean, he's a good coach. His teams win. Um, his teams are involved in Region 1 league play last couple of years, so he, he gets it. He, he gets it. That's the best way I say it. He just he gets what's going on, so it makes my job uh, a lot easier. So that's one thing to think about. Um, creative partnership between the executive director and, um, and the DOC. Uh, 
I think that has to be being full time and your executive director full time. It's easier that way. Um, just curiosity, how many are full time staff coaches for their club? Okay, it's different. So you all have regular jobs and then you're all sucked into this world. I hear you. All right. Um, very defined roles for your executive director and your DOC. Um, and that's, uh, we've done that last since I, I, I was at the club back in the 90s before I went full time with US soccer and then I came, actually came back to the club again. And so, but this time around I was a little bit smarter than the last time. So we kind of, it's very good. We have a great partnership and we, everything we do, he handles the business side, I kind of handle the soccer side and it works out pretty well for us. Um, DOC as an administrator, these are some of the things that I think that are very helpful to be an effective DOC. One-on-one uh, -on -one communicator. One-on-one um, -on -one with your coaches, one-on-one -on -one with your players, one-on-one -on -one with your parents. Um, I'm very open as a DOC, a technical director. I, I'll have a meeting with any set of parents and some of them are interesting more so than others, but it's, uh, there's all kinds of reasons why parents want to meet with you. Um, one of my favorites was we have like we have a, a league in our called Central Maryland Short Side League and the rules of play were basically that you could couldn't play more than one game a day which is a pretty simple rule. So one of our coaches basically was afraid that his team was going to get demoted from first division to second division so you know you have the club pass and you can borrow players so they were side by side at this one site and first half he borrowed two players from our first team because he needed to beat this team. So he borrows two players in the first half from let's say Oscar's team and so they play and it, and it helps and then second half those two go back and he borrows two more. So in essence by the letter of the rule he's not broken any, any rules. But he certainly where I got called into it was the kids that were on the roster that didn't get playing time because of the players going back and forth as you can see what you're going to deal with and so with that so we changed the rule all right well, basically you can only play for one game for one team per day so we, we had to basically just make a rule change within the league so that it would work but you know again it was like you know the parents were really upset and then you deal with the the coach and he goes well I didn't break any rules I said yeah but you certainly you certainly didn't do it what the intent of the law was or the rule was. So that was one of my interesting ones over the years. Um, have a leadership style. Uh, you as the person in charge. Um, some of you have to do president, executive director, and DOC. All of you doing, any of you guys doing that? All three? You guys deserve medals. I like it. So, so anyway, that's, that's whatever you do as a DOC a t or TD, develop your own personal leadership style and be yourself. Um, you're passionate and those of you that have all three jobs you obviously are passionate about what you do um, so it's basically you're just in it for the club you know you, you just bleed club colors and you, you, you got it going stay current in the game um, and that's basically involving all aspects of things that your players are going to be doing futsal you know uh, small-sided play outside and you know and your current leagues that you're in uh, who controls um, what leagues your teams play in. I mean, you all play in the Capital District, I assume, because that's all one big league. So, but is there any other options for your players? EDP, Region 1, you have all those kinds of things. Um, and I think a, a modern club has to basically look at all aspects of where they can send players to play. Um, teams here can play in U.S. club events, can't they? As well as USYS, okay. So that's kind of where, that's kind of where everything's been headed. Um, Coach, player, parent, disciplinarian, um, not the fun part of the job, but it's certainly real. Uh, I would say every week that I'm on the job, it never ceases to amaze me how coaches basically do dumb. Is that a good way to put it? Um, I hate to say that, but when you're in the administrative role, you gotta, you gotta look at it that way. I mean, Coaches are giving you all they have. Most of them are volunteers. They're not all paid coaches, but sometimes they just do things that just make it difficult if you're the administrator trying to deal with it. So it's good. We'll get into that a little bit more of things that you can do to basically have meetings and cover all the various aspects that you have to do. But it's kind of what we deal with. Coaching staff package. Um, sponsorships for your clubs. 
Uh, what I mean by that is like, what do you give through your sponsor, your sponsor, your, your uniform sponsor, or do you have a, a good club package that you give your clubs for serving? Um, some like on the rec side, most of those, you know, get like a, you know, like a warm up top or a, an Apollo or something to that effect. Uh, travel side, use a kind of a kit where it's a polo, shorts, and a, a warm up or a jacket or something to that effect. So just kind of work with your various sponsors that you can to try and get as good a deal as you can get. Um, some situations are where the board or the administrators kind of control the package and then kind of have to divvy it out from there. So it's kind of like then if you're in charge of all three, it's easier. But if you're the, the TD, you got to work with your executive director or president to make it a little bit better package because it works. People travel for the gear. I hate to say it, but they do. You know, they like gear. Club budget. Um, get involved as a DOC in the budgeting process. Know what's going on. Know where, you know, what rec, uh, rec players are paying for their fees. Know what travel players are paying for their fees. Um, obviously, you'll, we'll get into, I think, the coaching salaries here in a second, but that's all part of the process. So as a DOC, TD, in, in today's environment, you have to know what's going on. How much is, is a, a player going to pay on a travel team that's going to play EDP, Region 1, um, State Cup, those kinds of things. And it's, I don't know about here in, in, this, in Eastern New York, but in Maryland, you play about, pay about $700. And that, that's, it could be a one game and out. You get a nice Adidas ball, but you first, but I don't know, is that, what's the fee to play State Cup in Eastern New York? Anybody know? Roy? Just to get into State Cup. What is it? That's not bad. And then you, what, you pay referees per game as you go? What's going on in Maryland then? So, I mean... Uh, that's, yeah, maybe that's a good deal. Maryland, it's it's one that's what kind of keeps it very limited. So we have probably about 50-50 with teams going state cup, 50 the other 50 going in the Presidents Cup. If you're familiar with that, just because it's you know you're paying a lot of money for one game. So interesting. I we'll have to take that information back. Um, again, know your product sponsors and their impact on your budget. Kind of talked about that. I always tease our executive director, you go make the money and then I'll, as your TD, I'll spend the money, kind of a thing. Um, he, most times he thinks it's humorous, but you know, the other time, I always, but I always look for things like, can we get more full size goals, small sided goals on our fields um, that we can use them for training, you know, like, like for an example, on our full size fields, we'll have two full side goals. Um, and you know, when you're a coach and you rent a field for half a field, I feel that our coaches should be able to go, especially with the older age groups when you're playing 11 v 11, is that you should be able to have two full side goals going on half a field. And so uh, it's one of my missions and projects, but you know, I'd rather have a grass field turned into a turf field and things like that. So he kind of uses it, the, the executive director kind of says, well, what's your first priority? And he knows what my first priority is, turn like a grass field into a turf field. So, so that's kind of where we are. So, but as, a, as the t technical director of DOC, Kind of look for ways that you can improve your product through, you know, the budget process. Um, coaches' salaries and contracts, one-year contracts for coaches. Most people in here, for paid coaches. Paid? Do we have paid coaches in the clubs? Yes. No. How many uh, are all volunteer? Wow. And paid is the rest. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask? Is that just the nature of the beast up here? Why is that? Numbers? Smaller clubs? Okay. I, I know that if, when I was working with the youth in Dallas and, and I came back to, to Maryland, I basically had to raise the salaries of the coaches because I had to try and gradually get them used to sticker shock because it's, you have places in some parts of the country where coaches are getting paid $1,000 per player. So if you're coaching a small-sided, small-sided team of maybe 10 players you're going to make you know 10 grand for coaching a, a U a U9 team um, and that's that's real <laughs> it's happening um, we had one coach that was coaching three teams in FC Dallas uh, who was making probably $85,000 for coaching three teams 
And I was first assistant with the first team, uh, but executive director of the youth. But then our two other assistants were making less than our club coaches were making, you know, from the first team. And as you know, the pressure is pretty intense at that level, so it kind of didn't make sense. So, but anyway, I tried to bring it up so to, to where the coaches are getting kind of standard fees now. Um, and that's basically, we also do the same thing where your coaching salary, that's confidential information. We don't release that to our teams. They can try and figure it out, but we believe that that agreement is confidential. So we keep it that way in the club. Um, but there are people who, when they have very little fees and they say, well, our coach is getting $12,000. Well, yeah, they could figure it out, you know, but that's just the way it is. All right. Um, age specific equipment needs kind of talked about that. Uh, very small sided goals. I mean, within your club, um, do we have anybody doing five, six year old programs with goals or without goals? Pug goals. Yeah, that's what we use. Um, anybody seen the Dutch, there's a Dutch soccer school, is anybody involved with any of those? They got a nice little set of small goals that they always use that they're running around and but they're pretty little pricey things. So, uh, but we stick with the pugs as a way. When do you start using more bigger goals? U7, U8, you get into the bigger goals? U10. Um, so I've, I've kind of heard, no, I don't really, this is another thing that's gonna impact all of us is basically if they do the mandatory 9v9 at, at U12, have you heard about that mandate? It's kind of out there. I mean, until it's passed, we don't have to worry about it. But I started thinking ahead about how does that, what size goals are they going to use? And so when I asked somebody from U.S. Soccer what size goals they were going to use, the two sizes that they gave me, one of them was the uh, uh, FA size goals. I'm going, well, that really isn't smart. I mean, there's nobody, well, this is what they use in England. I said, well, nobody here is using the size goals that they're using in England. So I said, why don't you just go by with the, what the quick goal uses, which is like, for like U9 or one U12 is like, I think six and a half by 12 and a half. Is that right? Does anybody know? U7 by 21. What is it? U7 by 21. Yeah. So, but just kind of use what's already out there so clubs don't have to go purchase new goals because they're, this is all going to come up. Um, they're also thinking about, yes. I think I do. Um, it has to do with, yeah, I mean, they never really got, U.S. soccer was never in that kind of a situation where it wanted to mandate things. It couldn't even spell the word. So it was like, um, so now they're in the point where through coaching education, Dave Chesler is pushing uniformity because, I mean, most of you know this, I mean, you can play, you can play 11 v 11 now at 11 with, I mean, in some states. Um, and so I know that in our state, we do have teams playing 11 v 11. We have teams playing at 11 v 11 at U12, various leagues. Some are playing half. They start out with like 8 v 8, and then they go to 11 v 11 in the spring. So it's kind of a, a mess that way. So there's some uniformity. In, and basically, if you can't, like our state doesn't sanction anything above 8 v 8 for U12. That's what our state cup is for, for U12. But you can go with U.S. club, and you can play 11 v 11. And so I don't know if it's just, you know, trying to stop one organization over the other, you know, whatever. So that's kind of the logic that's behind it to get it uniform. So every, the coaches are set. Everybody's teaching the same thing at, at U12. So, but it'll change. And also the other thing that's out there that you got to be aware of is maybe going back from, instead of August 1, going back to January 1. So I don't know when that's coming, but I feel like that's coming down the road. So everybody will have that mess for one year and then, and everything changes, then you're, you're back to where you are. So it's going to be in line with ODP. Um, let's see. Uh, 501C3, I'm not the expert on that. Some of you guys probably are more expert on that, but I just realized it's, it's, it's non for profit. It's basically if you've got a board and you've got to have bylaws and you've got to have basically how you're going to deal with, you get the exemption for state sales tax, I believe. Anything else anybody can add to that? It's, that relates to, it's a good thing to have because when you're buying equipment needs and everything else, it's nice to have that exemption on state sales tax, you know, as well. Yeah.
provisions are bylaw for the most part, so I guess we haven't looked at that or thought about it. Yeah. I All think, uh, John, I think the and, and thing with the 501c3, you mentioned it, having a board as opposed to having just a club president and who runs everything and maybe a couple of volunteers under him who make, you know, uh, final decisions. Right. With the 501c3, I, I think yeah, that board has to You have to have a board and they have to come up with the bylaws. Right. You know, I, I, you know, I made sure that that was correct on that one. So, um, so that's just something to think about as you go forward. Uh, let's see. Uh, club webpage. Everybody have a website for everything. So, so webpage management, um, coaching education calendar, technical training sessions, coaches corner, uh, current teams, coaches listing, tryouts next season, current season. I mean, you haven't even started your season, but how many calls are you getting about tryouts? And that's just the nature of the beast. So it's coming. So. For us, on our coach's corner, that's where I put in, in the coach's corner, I put lesson plans. I have like stuff from USYS in our coach's corner, their uh, U6 manual, their U8 manual. We also have coaching manuals from the club that I did in my first stint with the club, which covers U6 all the way through U14. Um, trying to convince parents and of that it's okay when I say U7, I mean U8, I'm also talking about the seven-year-olds, U seven-year-olds and the six-year-olds because they, well, what are you doing for them? I'm going, well, they're covered under this. And so it's kind of, you have to co constantly re-educate the parents in your club as to, okay, we're using two-year increments, but your son, your son and daughter is covered under the current system. So in there, I put that kind of information. I also put our curriculum in there uh, that they can look at. Um, and I'll kind of cover a little bit about that this afternoon. I put in some, what I call player, uh, positions um, as far as their uh, like their roles and responsibilities of, of like a defender in possession defender out of possession I put that on there so they can see the coaches can see that kind of information and we go from there all part of the of the web management stuff um, technical training sessions um, we'll do for the coaches we'll do sessions uh, in, in August first last week in August and we'll also do some scheduled for uh, the end of March. It's probably a little suspect with the snow we've all gotten, but we'll see what happens. Um, but we kind of have all that stuff going on, so we kind of always do it. So we always cover, again, U, U8, U10, U12, U14, because our rec department go, uh, side goes up through U14. And so we're constantly you know, giving our coaches uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so they get opportunities to, to get out and get information. And we also think about the assistant coaches. And so we, I'm not thrilled with it. I kind of tolerate it, but it was kind of, I'm trying to change it within the club, but it's like if, if the assistant coach wants to get the polo, the same one as the head coach on the rec side, they got to come to the coaching education training for their age group. And I always like to say, like, the person is volunteering their time. We can't give them a polo, you know, that kind of a thing. So, but it's like, it's, it's a work in progress for me trying to get to that. But it, it does get the coaches, the parent coaches out because um, they'll do anything for a polo. <laughs> well, that's just reality. Um, key elements for club success, uh, player development, staff development, revenue development. Um, player development, now you're, if you're all encompassing club, I assume it's, it's dealing, what we call a clinic, which is our U, U5, U6, and then we get into our rec uh, side. And in the rec side, we have uh, at seven and eight, and then at nine, though, we start what we call rec select. So it's kind of like a, an all-star. So we have districts, at, at, let's say four districts within our, our, our area of involvement. And so we basically then pick, hopefully pick two teams from each of these districts to give us rec select. And then we have tryouts for those players from our rec. So it's, again, you've been through it, I'm sure, is that there's always the parent out there, set of parents that they, they want more. No matter what you do, they always want more for their kid. Even to the point where sometimes they're, they're with your club and with one of the teams, and yet the next thing you know, you hear about them doing individual training from the coach from another club, and, and so on. So it's, there's always somebody out there. So we try and cover as much as we can. So we have this rec select, 
And then at, also at that age, we have what we call the challenge program. So at U9 Rec, we have a challenge team that can play in tournaments, limited amount of tournaments for the fall and the spring. And they have to go through me as for approval as to what tournaments they have to go through. So we kind of limit it to two in the fall, two in the spring, so they can play in four tournaments. The problem with that sometimes though is if you say you have one or two good teams already in your travel side of the club and now all of a sudden you have your rec side doing this, what are you doing? You're forming, and I don't know if that's possible in your area here, but it is in ours, is all you're doing is basically building a team for somebody else's club to steal, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's a problem here or not, but I know it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> a little sort of, but I know it is in ours. And so you, you basically, you know, I made the, the, and each of those age groups at, at rec, we have what's called age group coordinators. And so I've kind of made the age group coordinators on the rec side aware that this is out there. And so you just have to be aware of it. So you have to get good, solid people who are club passionate involved in doing the right thing. Um, I've turned our, our rec um, person, head of rec, director of recreation on the administrative side She's been coaching trial, uh, like rec forever, and she always coaches these challenge teams. And I kept trying, and when I got there, I said, well, her name is Wilma. I said, Wilma, why don't you just coach travel? I mean, you've got basically a travel team now, so just, you know. And she kind of didn't want to do it, but then all of a sudden, she starts losing players to our travel team and to another club's travel teams, and all of a sudden now she says, well, I want to be a travel coach. So it's kind of out there, and so I had to get her convinced that it was actually going to take place. We had a club that just got Ellicott City Soccer Club formed in our area and just in our backyard because our club's out of Ellicott City as well. And we didn't, get, we didn't lose hardly any of our travel players, but we lost a lot of our rec select players who, as you would think, want to become travel player, travel teams. And so that's kind of how it worked. So it's, as a DOC TD, you have to just constantly keep abreast of what's going on around you at all times. Um, staff development. Coaching education has got to be huge within your club. Uh, now everybody has to take the F uh, license and being on national, I was talking about this last night to some of the other instructors here and Roy and, and uh, as a national instructor, we all had to take the F license. And luckily I passed. So uh, there you go. I took the F tonight and I passed. And it is excellent. It is a very good course. It's good, it's good. They did a, did a nice job. And so now you have to do the F, which is an online course, before you go to the E. Then you take the E, and then the D now, as you know, is two parts. This coming year, uh, the C course is going to be in two parts. So you have to do it one part, and then you come back to a what they call a performance center and take your test. So you don't actually do your final testing while you're there. You have time after you finish the course to go back, practice some more, and then you come back and then you take your testing. So I can just stay from, I, I did a uh, B license in January, and the new system kind of worked where you as a coach are coming into a, a license and you have to do five lesson plans, one of which you have to video yourself doing stage two and stage three of the lesson plan, and you have to submit that video. You have to do a technical report of a game, a youth, usually a US uh, women's or men's national team youth game, you have to report on that. And I got to say that I felt that the level of, of quality of the practice coaching and the final test had improved just the fact that you had to do five lessons and videotape yourself before you got there. And we also now, the Federation has done a good thing. When you do your practice coaching at the national licenses now, they videotape your entire, your entire session. So then you would go one-on-one -on -one with your instructor and you would go over that in about a 30-minute period over that lesson that you did. So I, I think the progress is good. So if you had some apprehension in the past or maybe going forward, it's a good time to get involved in it now. So it's, it's for the better. Um, revenue development, how, just be aware of ways that you can make money for your club. Um, one of the things that um, we, what we did was basically to, in a way to save things for our, our, uh, our players is that we, from the age of 14 up in the travel side, we. We, started, we charged everybody $50, and that money goes strictly towards, you, have you, how many of you wear the college ID camps? Not to offend any college coaches there in the group, but it's a, it's a money maker for coll you know, college staff. And so what we did was, so I just, last year, I brought the college coaches to our club. So on three nights, 
I brought in four women's coaches and four men's coaches and uh, on, the, on the college side. And all of our players are four, from 14 up to U18 were eligible, obviously, or U17 because the 18s were finished. But they could come in for free and, and participate in a college ID program. We paid the college coaches pretty good money, $400 an evening for a two-hour session. So, and then you, two coaches on a field, you come, you're one half you're with one coach, next, and you're another, another coach the next day, and then you switch it at, after an hour. Worked out pretty good. So we probably put, in three nights, put our girls and boys through six different college coaches. So it worked out pretty good. So just a way to help you within the club solve an issue of, because as you know, when they get older and travel, it's about what are we doing for our, our older age players and such. So it worked out good for us. All right, it's going to be that way. Yes? Um, basically, it's like nowadays, uh, my son coaches at, out in Utah Valley, and, and they, I, went, I was there visiting him, and he, they were charging like, I don't know, maybe $120, $125 for a Friday evening session and a two on Saturday session. So for three training sessions, all the 90 kids came into the campus and the college coaching staffs watched the players and they basically, you know, just tried to, it's good for the, it's like a little mini camp, but they're also, you're putting a lot of players in front of the college staff to say, hey, there's some potential players here. And so that's kind of what they do on their campuses. So we kind of took it the other way. We brought the college coaches to us so that it, it, saved, it saves you, the parent, money. So you, you paid $50 instead of paying 125 and if you basically went to two or three of these it, it's costly so so now you're basically putting your players in front of six college coaches and paying fifty dollars and so it worked out pretty well I think it's a good idea to do uh, from a from a you know development kind of situation for your for your club so any any college coaches here is that yeah you do those what do you charge per 150 so it works. So I don't know what's going on. This is me the last time. <laughs> Hold on. I'm not the IT wizard that I seem to be. What happened here? Escape. I like it. Learn something. Um, player development, curriculum, um, club mission statement, club philosophy, age specific materials. Again, this is stuff that you all can put on your web page. Um, and like what I did on the curriculum was basically I, I just took age specific, um, you know, basically tactically where they should be doing, at specific age, technically what they should be doing, uh, psychologically what they should be doing, you know, and basically put in some social things as well, emotionally, you know, what they're going to do. Um, I mean, everybody pretty much knows Freddie Adu, so when, I, when Freddie came to me as a 12-year-old, as crazy as it seems, in the residency in Florida, um, would you think he had a little bit of trouble socially dealing with the likes of a, um, an Eddie Johnson or a Santino Caranta? Yeah, I mean, and as a 12 year he's trying to hang with the big dogs, and so it's, it's now at age of 14, he goes into D.C. and, um, and that with a big target on his back, but now he's dealing with a locker room of a lot older players. And so as much as we could see how he could do as on the field, but socially it was a nightmare for the kid. And I still think he's struggling, you know, because of it. It wasn't easy. I and mean, was he overhyped? Yeah, probably. I said, but still, I think social, the social aspect of what he was going through, I don't think anybody in this country has ever faced that as an individual. And I, you know, that's why I feel bad for him because he's still going through, you know, problems. Latest I've heard, I think he's going to be Sweden. Yeah. So, so that's those kinds of things that are on there. So your club philosophy, your mission statement. Um, I talked, not even any names, but I talked to one club, um, president, co-founder, and I said, what's your mission statement? And he's in the Baltimore area. Anybody familiar with the Baltimore Bays? All right. This is a rival of the Bays. So his mission statement was to destroy the Bays. 
I said, wait a minute, you can't have that as your mission statement. You know, it's, it's got to be a little bit more in depth than that, but that's kind of like, you know, let's just, you know, I don't, I didn't know how to get around that one, but it was like, you know, you just, and this is the president and co-founder of, nice guy, but whatever. Um, age specific materials, again, training manuals by age, you know, stuff that they, they, they know about field size and rules of play and all that kind of stuff should be on your website as far as age specific materials. Player evaluation, don't know what we use. We use Zoom reports. Uh, I happen to know the two guys that run it. They were down at IMG, playing for IMG when I was down there with the 17, so I got to know them. And it's pretty good, actually. They basically you evaluate your player uh, electronically, four categories, the four components of soccer, technique, tactics, psychological, and uh, physical. And you, you basically, they, they send out emails with that. Uh, they charge you a dollar per player very reasonable um, you know how you want to do it and they and it allows you the format is so good that, that you can actually if you're IT tech savvy you can basically if you have video footage you can um, you basically can take some video clip and to prove your point and send it to the player and then they can respond to it works pretty good uh, we use that we also have an in-house version that they can use as well and then we also have a coaches evaluation on there that our that our parents can can do as well. A lot of people use Survey Monkey. I mean, the anonymous is the ano is it really anonymous though? No. And I think parents know that, so they don't really. So when you're trying to get some insight on a coach, um, there's still that fear of well, if he finds out or she finds out that I said this about them, then you know it's going to come back to hurt my son or daughter, so to speak. So yes. We have them do them after e the fall season and the spring season. And um, one of my young coaches made a you know, catastrophic mistake and uh, caught the, one, the first one and then the second one was coming. So he does the player evaluations at the team party. You know? And so, and of course, it was a negative one. So that blew up into this major thing, two page email for me and all this and that. And then when I talked to the coach, he says, well, I was planning to do it again at the skating party coming up. I'm going, no, that's a no, you know, just come into the office, do it in the office. I'll open it up for you. So it's, it's just, you know, just rookie moves sometimes that, that people do. But, it's, uh, but I think in-house evaluation, Zooms are very good. I'm, I don't get any kickback from it, but I just know that our coaches are pretty good at it. We, the template is just four components, and it's pretty easy to fill out for most coaches and go from there. Uh, let's see, staff development, um, so staff education, former licensing cl uh, club, continuing education, um, do most of the clubs, do you, I don't know how it works, do you host uh, coaching education courses within your club or is it done through the league? Both. Both? Both. The DF license is going to be a lot of club hosting, like where you see like three or four places. Okay. So it, it's good to kind of like we... We host a lot of e-courses because to coach Rec Select um, in our club, you have to have an e-license to uh, just just need a, an e-license to coach at the state level. I mean, some, some or coach a travel team at the state level. So, but some states require uh, that you need to have a D or, or whatever. Some even a C, but we just have an e-requirement. So, what is what's your requirement here to coach travel? So you gotta have at least a license. A license. The coach. They just have to have an F license or, an, uh, as you know, the, the yeah. F, everybody's going to be grandfathered in or already taken a license, NSCAA or whatever. Now all new coaches must have, have the F before they go on. Okay. All right. Um, staff evaluations, parental uh, coaching evaluations, we talked about a lot. Uh, DOC evaluations, so I basically, yes. I, I'm, that's DOC evaluating the coaches. Oh, uh, okay. All so right. Somebody ultimately will evaluate you. Yeah, I mean the the board and the executive director. You know, they they kind of they kind of oversee what you're doing, and so I think if you're making them money, they leave you alone, kind of. You know what I mean? So if your players, <laughs> if your if your program's growing and not diminishing, then it's then it's a good thing. So, but I think yeah. So I 
I evaluate, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more of it this afternoon, but I have like from U8 to U12, I have a person in charge of every, of every age group on the boys and girls side. So they're the head coach in the age group and they have a lot of responsibilities in there. They get paid a little bit extra money for doing that. And that's kind of who I spend most of my focus with. But then I'll explain, I, I make them give a report, a plan of you know, what all the teams are doing. And then they kind of give me a plan as to how the teams did after the fall season. So it's a little bit of, of work on their part as well. But I, I will go out and watch the coaches and, and then whether it's a, whether it's a written evaluation or actually a one-on-one -on -one just verbal kind of conversation. Um, players developed. Um, that's a big thing if you're a developmental academy. Um, how many players you can, can develop and get into the youth national team pools. Uh, that's a big thing. But for, for, I don't think, does anybody here have developmental academy at their club? Like we have just the 14s at ours. So because we just have the 14s, so we've lost probably three players in the last two years, good players, because we didn't have, we don't have 16s or 18s who have gone to DC United. So, but once they go to DC United and they make national teams, who do you think takes credit for it? Not, a, they, they take credit, we don't get any credit. So that's all the clubs are asking for is that, you know, if you send a team, a player to the pro MLS kind of developmental academy, then they at least, when they make it to the pool, you, you're kind of listed in there as getting credit for developing your players. So that's a big thing. Uh, revenue development, uh, again, uniform sponsor from the, your, whoever does your, your uniforms for your club. Uh, equipment sponsor, uh, any kind of uh, special deals you can get. Um, better get it fast because if they change the goal size when they go to U12, you better have it in place before that happens. Hopefully they won't change it. Um, facilities sponsors, indoors, outdoors, community sponsors, summer holiday camps. That's a big uh, revenue for us, holiday camps. Um, and it's basically that every day that the schools are closed or the students don't have to go to school in Howard County, we hold a, basically a holiday camp. And um, we're probably averaging about 40 to 50 players. You can go all day, you can do, there's half day, morning, half day, afternoon, or you can go all day. And so during the winter, we basically just use one of the, one of the indoor facilities that we work with. Um, they pay, I think it's $75 for all day. Um, it's pretty cheap babysitting, but we, we, we keep it soccer oriented. It's not just a dumpster kind of a program where they're dumping them on you for, the, for that, but we actually have a, a staff of a lot of our travel coaches who are teachers who, who come work it. Um, other guys who are basically retired and coaching, they go and help out, but they're soccer people and they run soccer programs during the day. And, Numbers have increased since I've been there, and it's it's been very successful. We do something during the, the during spring break as well, uh, but it's a good if you're looking for ways to generate some revenue, it's an it's, it's an easy way to do it because, I mean, when schools are closed, you know, parents are looking for things that if they have jobs, they're looking for places to put their children instead of them staying home themselves. So it's it's a good way to work it out. It's big for us. You know, these camps? Yeah. No, not at all. I mean, we, we're, we, we'll, it's, actually we find that it's not, it's not even, a lot of the kids aren't even from our club, some of them, because they're just from soccer players in the area, and they're basically, it's, it's almost like you're holding a mini camp every day that the schools are closed. Because you have teacher work days, you have everything else that goes on, and um, it's, it, believe me, it, it works. I mean, you can make, it depends on what, you know, you pay our staff probably $25 an hour, to do them, and they're usually it's a it's a nine to four kind of a day, um, so they go it goes nine to twelve half day. Then there's an hour lunch, one to twelve to one, and then one to four. So it's three day increment, uh, three hour increments, and then I think it's uh, forty five dollars for a half day, if I'm not mistaken, and you can generate some revenue for your club because you can generally in one day you can put in a you know thousand to two thousand dollars into your to your kitty. So. And then how many days, how many days are they out of school during the year? I mean, it's probably close to 20 days. ID camps during the winter break is also something that goes on for various age groups as well. Uh, communication, club marketing, board of directors, BOD politics, 
only thing I say about BOD politics is what happens as a DOC when you have that board member whose son doesn't make the top team, son or daughter doesn't make the top team, and how, how do you deal with it, you know? Um, can't tell you how to deal with it. I know how I deal with it. It's, it's basically, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, but, um, but it does happen. We had, back in my first stint with the club, we had a gentleman who was vice president of the club, came to me and said, my son didn't make this person's team. You got to put him on the team. I said, no, I'm not going to put him on the team. Why would I put him on the team? So he takes his son, bo both the sons out of the club, goes to the bays, pays the coach $15,000 to coach each of his sons, builds a gym, and I kid you not, for McDonough High School. That gym, it's at McDonough High School in Owings Mills, Maryland. He built all for his kids, you know, that whole thing at once. It was like, crap, if I'd known that, maybe I'd have kept him. He could have built a gym for us. <laughs> You know, Jim never came up in the discussions, you know, but, um, yeah, exactly. But it was like, you know, and then, so now this youngest son went to Duke, didn't play much. So I always wonder, did that same kind of thing? I was looking for a new gym to pop up at, but Cameron Hall has still been there forever. So I don't think Coach K is going to leave that bad boy anytime soon. Um, coaching staff, communication with your staff. Well, I, it's important before every, time you do tryouts within your club that you pull all your people involved like that's why I have the guys that are head of the each age group I bring them all in we talk about tryouts because they're going to run the tryout for their age group so we all go through it all it's all cut and dry everybody knows what's going on we're all on the same page so that's that's the big part um, one of the things from a, what I got away from and I'll, I'll elaborate more later on but is by having somebody in charge of the age group and then you have everybody on a half a field. Let's say you have four or five teams in an age group and they're for their one technical training session, mandatory, you know, for the, between U8 and U12, the coach is in charge of it and he has little, you know, like uh, rotations, uh, stations set up. The one thing I don't hear anymore is that from parents saying, well, the head, the first team coach doesn't, didn't know my player, hasn't seen my player. You guys are familiar with that, I, I think, during tryouts where, you know, he didn't even look at my child or whatever it was. It's totally eliminated that um, because now 10 times in the, in the fall and 10 times in the spring, um, the head coach age group is seeing every kid in the age group. And you see him on, and he's actually working with him because he's in charge of one of the stations. So it's totally eliminated that side of tryouts, which can be, you know, pain in the butt at the time because, you know, you don't know whether – they have or they haven't really, but now I know that they have. They've seen them. Um, age group meetings, kind of what I was talking about. DOC, TDs, point of contact for colleges. College coaches are calling you, they email you because they're making the assumption that you know your players, and so they want to they get some in, input from you regarding that. And, and at, use your contacts as, your, as a TD, DOC to help get colleges or help get players into college, you know, let them. Let them get their dreams. And we, one kid was looking at, at our club, was all he thought he was going to play Division Three. It just worked out. He, I got him into Winthrop, and he ended up starting for him. Uh, so he's playing D1. And, it, you know, it was kind of just a meeting between the player and the parent and myself. And I just used my contacts to try and get him to have a look, you know. So I think, like, D1 is different. But D, I'm kind of losing because it's been a while since I've been in college. But can't you add D2 and even D3? Can you look at the players beforehand? Like in a, I, I don't know, I'm just asking a question, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. You can look at them like you're On campus? Um, if, they can come visit you. I mean, can, can you look at them at a practice? They've come to an ID camp, I guess was how you would, you yeah, would look at them. Like Not D3? Or, uh, okay. Can, can yeah, I can, okay, that, that area, okay. All right. Yeah. So it sounds like at the D three level that that kind of thing is okay. Yeah, because I I lose track of the rules. I mean, we do have a, a somebody who does, like for the club, we pay him one hundred and fifty dollars a session. He's assistant coach at Loyola. He comes in, he talk with meet with families, uh, individually, and he also meet with teams and talk about what's going on. Because they're more. I've sat through a couple of them, but there's so many rules now that it's it's hard to what you can do and what you can't do. But it's good to have somebody like that on staff. 
All right, last slide. This is my don't list. Um, don't ignore budget involvement. Don't be a poor communicator. Don't be afraid to use modern technology like the escape clause like I was just instructed on. Uh, the big one is don't cringe when DOC is called an administrator because most DOCs don't like to think of themselves as an administrator, but it's real. You are an administrator. And uh, don't be unavailable. Uh, I'll meet with anybody, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, I met with two families recently just talking to me about what private Baltimore area school their kids should go to. So it's, it's interesting how that all comes up. They, they kind of trust you enough that you can, they're going to listen to you, what you have to say about what school to go to and whatnot. You know, for me, it kind of, I also kind of, yeah, there is a bias because some of the, if I send them to McDonough, they'll probably end up playing for Celtic, for example. So I got to be careful of where I'm going to send them as well because I don't want to lose them in the club. You know, that's just the other real thing you have to think about. So any questions? Yes. Yes. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Thank you very much. Good. You do. I mean, it's just real. Huh? Does every club need DOC regardless of size? Yeah, they do. Somebody has to be that focal point at the club level for the soccer. Has to be that person. And if you're president, you know, and DOC and executive director, I mean, you still have to act in those capacities as a DOC. You have to be available to your coaches, your parents, your players. Can you be successful Yes, you can. Did it many times. I mean, most of us all did it back before the pre-pay days. You know, I was coaching the team and DOC for Olney Soccer Club for basically just for experience. And so, yeah, you know, you can, you can be effective. Yeah. Any thoughts or tips on getting a part-time DOC for the first time for the club? Um, pay, volunteer or paid? Paid low. Well, I know that I coached the UMBC. They were D2 when I went there for $1,500. And that was 1981. So that's not a big, and I was a full-time teacher at the time. So I think, yeah, yeah, there's plenty of people who are looking for that opportunity to be a DC, a DOC at a, at a, at a, at a club level and, and move up from there. I think, yeah, I, they'll, they'll do it. I have a couple of people, I don't know if they'll move to New York, but I have a couple of people that would like to do it, and I know that. Yeah. What about just you know, small, real small clubs? Would it make any sense to have a retired coach? How small are we talking? 100, 130 kids. Okay. A job share DOC, someone who, who is DOC for a couple of local small clubs. Yeah. Is there too much of a conflict? With no. They, they have a group, like for example, Damascus Soccer Club, uh, Alua Soccer Club, and there's two Fred, there's a Frederick FC and a Frederick SC. And so Frederick SC, those three clubs came together and formed a, a group called Alliance Soccer Club. And so probably in there, there are probably maybe 25 travel teams. And so when they came together, so like you just said, now they're just now they're looking to hire an executive director for the group and a DOC. So for the, independently, independently, but, but on the travel side, they come together. We're doing the same thing at the developmental academy level. So like Baltimore Bays has kind of had a rough time the last two years since Celtic players all, players left them and became Celtic. So now we have the 14s, but we're putting together a group called Baltimore Armor. And it's basically us, Pipeline, Bays, and Pro Soccer Academy, so to speak. And so to, to have a developmental academy. So we're all coming together. So it's, yeah, you can do that. You know, you're all, everybody has their own single entity, but then Collectively, you come together, and that's a good way to do it if you're a small club. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's oh, it's impossible. Yeah. So, but I think what you know, if you can get a couple other clubs to go with you, it works perfect. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Now, how far? It depends. I guess the distance is so somebody who can cover the distance in between. How many how many teams clubs do you have within the capital district? Quite a lot, 90 plus. 52? Clubs? Clubs. 70? They've lost a couple of them in the last couple of years. Okay. Wow. That's big. That's, I mean, we have that many clubs in the state, so you guys have it in one district. So, all right, well, thanks for your time.
See you this afternoon.